Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for my session on .NET 2020. My name is Cecil Phillip and I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. And what I want to do is have a conversation with you about some distributed messaging patterns that you can make use inside of your applications today. So regardless of whether you're hosting on premises or you're in the cloud, or maybe you're doing a little bit of both with a hybrid model, I think some of these patterns that you'll see should be able to add some value to how robust and how resilient your services are. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Now, one of the first things that we should really think about as we're designing our distributed systems is, well, how exactly are they going to communicate with each other? Right? How am I going to get information from one part to another? Or how am I going to get information to all of the different people or different services that really need to know about it? And now, if we think about what are the different options that are available to us, there's a few ways that we could do this. So first, we can do a direct model where, hey, I'm just sending the message directly to the party or people that exactly need it. The next one is I can have a somewhat of a brokered model. So that means that I can have something sitting in the middle, like a message queue or some type of middleware that's going to be able to receive my messages and do some intelligent routing to send it to where exactly it needs to go. Or I could do a broadcast where I could send my message out and whoever happens to be interested in it could pick it up and they could you know, do whatever work it is that they need to do. Now, messaging is really all about getting information from one part to another. So I might have a client that needs to send message over to a server or a server that needs to send message to a server or whatever the case is. I have two parties that they need to be able to exchange information back and forth between each other. And sometimes it might look like this where I have one sender and one receiver. But sometimes it might look like this where I have a lot of different senders and, but I only have like one place to send it, right? I only have one thing that's listening and waiting to receive that message. And sometimes our initial client or service might have a lot of information it needs to send over the wire. And we have to figure out an intelligent way so that B can make sure it receives all of that information. There might be even situations where I need to send messages that go out to tons of different folks. Right? And so we need to be able to figure out, well, how is that one message going to get spread across and sent to everyone? And sometimes on the other side, there may be tons of different types of folks. And all of these different services are doing something different with the message. So the things that they care about and the things that they want to know about and the things that they do are definitely not the same. Another thing that we should think about as we consider messaging is the fact that, well, what happens if I send a message and there's no one on the other side that's listening or paying attention? Like, what happens to it? Like, what do I do with it now? Another common scenario for messaging is when that underlying transport is just not available or it's experiencing some problems. So now, how do I, how do I get my message over there? How do we deal with that type of situation? And of course, now, what does it look like when I'm trying to send a message from one part to another, but the other side is really busy? And they can't deal with your message right now. So like maybe I have to wait or maybe I have to send it later, right? Like how do we handle those situations on the client side? Another thing that's really important for us to pay attention to as we're building out our systems is what exactly are the different protocols that are available to us and how exactly can they help us achieve our communication goals? So for instance, I'm showing you here a few protocols that may or may not be familiar to some of you already. For instance, like HTTP and WebSockets are generally used a lot inside of browser applications or whenever we're building web APIs. You know, you'll generally see like a request response type interaction with using these types of protocols where the sender is actually expecting to get a response back in a relatively short period of time. When you move on to something like AMQP, which is more of a message queuing protocol, now this is usually used in cases where we have messages that need to get sent but then we're not expecting an immediate response and maybe not even expecting a response at all. And then now going down to something like MQTT, which is used a lot in IoT-based applications and used in devices that don't have a lot of processing power and need to really preserve that battery. One of the things that you should notice here about all of the different protocols that I'm showing you is that they're all based on some type of standard. So that means that I should be able to use different types of clients. I should be able to use different types of servers or services. But as long as they're able to understand that underlying protocol, then I should be able to talk to them. I don't have to figure out a new way to do it. I don't have to figure out a new format to do it in. We should be able to use this, and this should be able to work just fine. 
Okay, now the patterns that I do want to show you today are essentially broken up into two different parts. First, I want to talk to you about some synchronous communication patterns, and then I'm going to talk to you about some asynchronous communication patterns. Right? And so with synchronous communication patterns, um, very similar to like using things like HTTP or gRPC, those are used in cases where I'm expecting to send a message, but then my sender or my client, I'm actually going to wait for a response, and I'm going to expect that to come back again, in a relatively short period of time. And, you know, even though this is called, quote unquote, synchronous communication, you know, that doesn't mean or doesn't have to do anything with, you know, doing async work or doing, or doing anything with async within your particular programming language. You know, this essentially just means that I'm going to send a request and am I going to wait for that response or not? One of the things that you'll notice in this pattern of messaging is that because the request and the response are so tightly coupled together, we're able to very quickly know when things happen. So that means that if I send a request and everything came back successfully or everything was processed successfully, I'll know relatively quickly. You know, if there was an error in sending or, you know, receiving the request on the other side, well, I'll know definitely very quickly by, you know, I'll probably see like a, a status code of status code 500 or 400 level status code or something of that sort. Also, too, we're very implicitly able to match the requests and responses together because, again, because we we're waiting for that response to come back to the associated requests, we know how to match them together. We know how to enable things like tracing in a little bit more of an easier way because they're associated by default. On the other side now, we're also going to talk about asynchronous communication where now my sender can send a message and then kind of just move on to do something else within that same thread of execution. And this is good for cases where, again, I might expect a response back, I might not expect a response back, or I might expect that my response is going to take a really long time to process before I can get it back. So I'll just go ahead and move on with life until it's ready to go. So now let's take a look at some synchronous messaging patterns that we could use inside of our apps. Um, I actually feel like a lot of us here that are watching right now are probably very familiar with some of these. So what I want to do instead of talking about, well, this is what an HTTP message is, and this is what a gRPC message is, and this is how you send it with an HTTP client. Why don't we look at some of the more problematic scenarios and try to come up with some interesting ways of how we can solve them. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. Now, you may recall a scenario that I pointed out earlier in the presentation in which I have a server that's taking requests from various clients, but now these clients may be sending requests at different times, at different rates, and also with different needs in terms of processing time for each individual request. And now with a single server like this, being able to deal with all these clients, well, it puts a lot of strain on the machine. And now one of the tactics that we could use is to employ a throttling strategy. Now with throttling, what the server is gonna do is let the clients know that, hey, you're sending too many requests too quickly and you need to slow down. And one of the ways that the server could do this is by being able to individually identify the different clients that are making those requests to it. And they could do it by IP address or maybe even a client header or you know, some identifier that's going to get passed over with the request. And now based on that, the server can let those clients know, hey, you should try back in five minutes. You should try back in five seconds. You're sending messages too fast. Well, I'm going to stop processing your requests until your threshold has passed. Now, of course, the client is completely free to continue to send messages if it wants to, but what's going to happen on the server side now is that that recipient, that server, that thing that's taking in those requests from you is going to start to deny those requests. And you're going to see a lot of error messages popping back, like unable to process the request or there was some invalid request that was sent or something of that sort. So then it would be in the best interest of the clients to pay attention to some of those responses that are coming back from the server and adjust its behavior accordingly. Now, based on how this communication is happening between the client and the server, the underlying protocol should be used to be able to pass that metadata back and forth between the client and the server. So if I'm using something like HTTP, I should be able to leverage the headers that are inside of an HTTP request or response to be able to share that information about what the throttling state is for that particular client. And now on the client side, I should be able to read that information out. I should be able to look at that metadata and adjust my behavior accordingly. So whether that is maybe I just stop sending requests completely, maybe is I stop sending requests for a certain period of time, or maybe it's even a case of that I send an alert to someone else 
to let them know that, hey, I'm unable to send these messages or I'm unable to move forward with whatever workflow I'm doing, please come ahead and you know, pay attention to this. Another option we have when it comes to dealing with a lot of requests coming into machine is, well, we could just add more servers, right? So that means that we can just have more servers that are processing the requests that are coming in from all these different clients. But then that puts us now in a scenario where, well, the clients need to know where all of these other servers are that are available to handle my requests and process my messages. The problem that this scenario introduces is now, well, how do all of these clients know about all of these servers? Like, where exactly am I sending my messages to? Like, which one do I use? Which one is available? Which one is, which one is not too busy? And then as additional server resources are spun up or taken off, how do I know which ones are still active within the cluster? One of the things that we could do to make this a little bit easier is to add a reverse proxy in the middle of our clients and servers. So what will happen is that now the clients only need to know where the proxy is, and then the proxy knows where the rest of the servers are. And so when the client sends a request, it could be able to send messages to whatever server is available. What's good about this approach now is that the proxy could be intelligent enough to know, well, which servers are getting a lot of requests or which servers are under a lot of load and be able to distribute the requests out in some type of intelligent way. Another benefit of using a proxy is that now a lot of those cross-cutting concerns that might have to be applied to each server, well, we can apply some of those to the proxy now. So when you think about things like our throttling scenario that we talked about earlier, well, instead of implementing that on each server, well, we could just put that in the proxy or things like caching or security or, you know, all of these different things can happen on the proxy level. So before they even get down to the server, they're already taken care of. So now our server code becomes a little bit less complicated to deal with. You know, it's concerned about dealing with a lot less things. And now we have a proxy up front that's able to handle a lot of these different types of clients. And on the clients now, they don't need to know where the servers are because the proxy is just handling all of that for them. It's almost like a, a form of you know, server-side service discovery, just that the clients don't have to be involved in that. Now, we talked a little bit about what can happen on the server side, but what can we do on the client side as well to be able to be a little bit more resilient to when we're sending messages to systems that are, to systems that are being hosted somewhere else? Well, one of the common things that we all know as engineers and, and networking folks is that the network is unreliable. Like never trust the network because things can happen, right? The network can go down. The server on the other side could go down. The network could be really slow. The network could drop packages and lose parts of your message. And so in those types of situations, we're going to need to be able to recover by sending those messages again. This is where retry strategies come into play. So if I'm using something like HTTP client, for instance, I'm trying to make a request over to a web API or to a web server, and I don't get a successful response back. Well, one of the things that I could do is just send a message again and send it again and send it again and send it again, at least until I have confidence that either my message got accepted or maybe that server is just not available for me to send requests to. Now, one of the libraries that I love to use that helps me implement some of these retry strategies is an open source project called Poly. And Poly has a lot of different options that we can configure when we're thinking about doing retries. One of the things that we can even do is tie it into the throttling that's happening on the server. So if I make a request to a server and then I'm getting back a response that says 429, you're sending back too many requests. I could look at the header inside of my HTTP response message and usually the server would also send back something like, you know, you can send the message, but you could try it again in two minutes or three minutes or five seconds or whatever the case is. And now on my client side, I could set that delay, right? I'll delay for five minutes. I'll delay for two seconds. I'll delay for two minutes until I know that the server says, okay, well, this is a time now that you can send these requests for me and I'll be able to deal with them for you. Now, we've talked about a few strategies that we could use when dealing with issues that can arise when sending messages using synchronous, a synchronous communication pattern. So why don't we take some time and head over to Visual Studio Code, and I can show you how we can implement these inside of an ASP.NET Core application. Now, what we're seeing here is that I have a few projects here in Visual Studio Code, but the first one I want to take a look at is this HTTP items API. Now, I'm going to go ahead and run this inside of the command line, and what we'll start doing is making some requests to this 
Notice it's listening here on port 5000. So I'm going to fire up Postman really quickly and I'll just make some requests. And notice that it's, oh, 5000, that's the wrong port. That's the wrong uh, endpoint. AT, API slash items. That's, that's where my stuff is. Okay, great. So I'm sent some requests and notice I'm getting some responses back and there's headers and, you know, HTTP is working how we expect it to work. Now, what would happen if I just started hammering this thing with requests? What if I started clicking this button too quickly? And now what you'll notice is that I no longer get a response now, but instead the status code's coming back as 429. And it says the user has sent too many requests in a given amount of time. And it's doing that because now on the server, I've turned on throttling. And so now that it's being throttled, the server can look at this specific client and say, hey, I know who you are and you're sending too many requests to me. I need you to back off a little bit. If we take a look at the headers that are here really quickly, you can notice that we also get a retry after. And if we take a look at that header, it's letting us know how many seconds do we, we need to wait before we can make another request. And in this case, it's just one second. Now, let's head back over to VS Code and we can see how exactly this was turned on. So here in VS Code, I want you to take a look at my app settings.json section. Oops, make that go away. Now, here in app settings.json, I have a section here called client rate limiting. And what I've done is I'm using a package called ASP.NET rate limiting, and I'm configuring it here inside of my uh, settings file, inside of my configuration file. So notice I can turn on things like, you know, I wanted to do rate limiting with, uh, with endpoint routing, right? I can specify the client header that you could look at, and then the expected return status code that can let us know that we're being limited. This is actually the default. I don't need to put this in, but you know, if you wanted to, you can configure that as well. And here inside of the rules, I'm saying for every client that comes in, any endpoint that you hit, you can make a one request a second, right? So I can make one request per second, but within a minute, right, I can make 100 requests, right? So as long as they're within these parameters, then I'll be allowed to have my requests move on towards my server backend and then you know, execute on it. But if not, then it'll just stop. The middleware will just stop it and send it backwards. Now, let's see how we wire this up inside of startup.cs. If I open that, here inside of my configure services section, you can see that I have, you know, I'm configuring the rate limit options and I'm getting that from configuration. You can see that, you know, I'm turning on a distributed cache rate limiting and then the policy store. And this is just really a way for that middleware that I installed to be able to, you know, know where the settings are and then know where to store the count, right? It has to count how many different requests that are there. You can do it in memory store if you wanted to, but I'm just using a distributed store. As we scroll down, if we take a look inside of the configure method, here on line 70, I have a method here that says use client rate limiting. And that's, that's the middleware part. That's the part that actually puts it into the pipeline. And so now I have that throttling capability enabled for my application. Okay, so there you go. So that's rate limiting. Now, remember how I showed you the rate limiting feature returns an HTTP header. Right, so now we're using the protocol to be able to get back um, useful information that we could use in our clients so they could know, well, whether or not it's actually sending information over too quickly. I want you to take a look now at my HTTP client worker that I have set up. This one actually has poly install, which would allow me to react to you know, me sending requests too fast. And let me show you how we can do that using the protocol and poly. So I'm going to head over here to my program.cs file. I know there's a lot here. I promise it's not too bad. But I'm using the HTTP client factory. This is the important part here. And I'm setting up you know, some base information I'm getting from my configuration file. So I'm giving it a base address and you know, some default headers. Next, I'm adding this method here. I'm calling this method here called add transient HTTP error policy. Now, this is actually coming out of a package that allows integration with Poly, that resilience framework that we spoke about, and with HTTP client. And so now there's some really interesting extension methods that are included in that that would allow you to create different retry and resiliency policies so that now your, your clients that you're using or you're creating would be able to know how to react to failures whenever they happen. So all that's happening here now is that I'm taking a look at the request. 
or more likely the response that came back from the um, from the server. And I'm, I'm going to get that retry after header out of the server. So remember we saw the retry header and that had one. So that let me know that I have to wait one second before I make another request. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look and see, well, did this thing fail because of a retry? And if it did, now I could be able to configure to, you know, to wait after that retry period to do it. And if not, then I just have my own defaults um, that's there, right? And so there you go. And then this last section that's here at the bottom on line 76, this is just an action method that's going to happen. And I'm just doing some logging so I can know, okay, well, my retry is actually firing. And so this is a good place to do some of that type of work. Okay. Now, what I want to do now is instead of running the server again, because I already have one of those, I'm going to run that HTTP client that I have. So I'm going to go into that folder. I'm going to run the HTTP client items worker. And now let's kind of look and see what these messages look like as it starts to generate load. So you'll notice the host started. And notice that you're going to see a lot of stuff going over the screen. But what you're going to see is that I'm sending 10 requests a second. But 10 requests is too much, right? I can only send like one or two requests a second. So what you notice is that as it hits those errors, it's saying, hey, 429, right? HTTP 429, I'm sending too many requests over and I'm logging it. But instead of me just failing on those requests, what I'm doing is I'm going to look in the header value and I'm going to see, well, okay, I need to wait this certain period of time before I can make more requests. And so then, you know, here's the payload from the first one. It's going to execute again. Notice it says retry attempt two, right? And it's just going to keep going and going. Now, notice now I have less and less errors that are coming. But it's just going to keep retrying and retrying and retrying and retrying until we got to complete it and now all of them are done, right? I don't have any more retries that I have to do. I don't have to wait any longer. Now I'm able to execute all my requests. But I wasn't just hammering the server constantly. Well, I guess I kind of was a little bit, but you know, that was only for the demo. Uh, what I was actually doing was looking at that header and using the protocol, getting that metadata out of the protocol to know this is when I could continue to make more requests. But what happened is that because I'm sending 10 requests, well, eight failed and then two were good. And then I sent eight more, then, you know, six failed and then I sent two more and then four failed and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what you're seeing in these log messages, right? But like a little bit at a time, I'm able to get in some of those additional requests with a little bit of a back off. Now, you might be able to create your own strategy that's probably a little bit more intelligent than mine. But again, this is just a really cool example of how you could use Poly to add some of those additional resi resiliency features to something like HTTP client. And if you're wondering what the package that I installed was, I'm gonna head over to my csproj file. And the package you need to look for is this one right here that says Microsoft Extensions HTTP Poly. Right, and I'm using version 3.1.6. I think at the time that I'm you know, making this video, that's the most current one that's there. But that would install everything you need to go ahead and add those extension methods. And now you could start to you know, add those strategies whenever you make a call with HTTP client. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and stop these. I don't need these anymore. Stop that one and stop that one. Great. So now you saw those retry policies, and then you also saw how we could do throttling. If you're interested in learning a little bit about a reverse proxy that we could use in .NET, something that you can add some of those additional middleware components and kind of customize it to work the way that you want it to work, I definitely recommend you checking out the YARP project. Um, it's an open source project, um, still in development at this time. You know, it's at github.com slash .NET slash re um, reverse proxy. There's tons of code samples there. There have been a few releases, so it's definitely something that you could try out today and, and see if it makes sense for what you're trying to do. Okay, so now let's, let's go ahead and move on. Now, I have a feeling that some of us might be already familiar with some of those patterns that I just saw, might have even implemented them yourselves. So let's see, let's move forward and talk a little bit about these asynchronous messaging patterns. And specifically, I wanna try and see if I could match them to some of those patterns that I just showed you before to see how we can solve some similar problems and maybe some additional ones as well. Now, long running work. There might be scenarios, I'm sure a lot of us have seen this type of thing, where I need to run some work. I need a job that has to run, I have to kick off a workflow or 
do something that's going to take a considerable amount of time. You know, that type of thing is not something that you'd want to use when you're working with a protocol like HTTP and, you know, calling web APIs and those types of things. And the reason is because when you make a request, if you make a web request or something like that, you know, the client is holding that socket open and it's waiting for that server to respond with some type of message. And, you know, if you remember, like, you know, the network is unreliable sometimes. So, you know, after a period of time, you know, there might be issues with your connectivity. The, the connection might drop or, you know, it might time out. Um, you know, some of these types of, of um, you know, some of this type of work might take hours or even days, you know, to, to actually wait and finish. And it's really not practical to have the client waiting that long for that work to happen. So you can imagine, you know, imagine what would happen if, you know, I went to some online store and I placed an order and, you know, they had me keep that socket open and keep that page open until the order was like fulfilled and shipped and got to my house. That'd be a little crazy, right? It's, it's a little impractical to expect something like that to have happen. So instead, a better pattern is to use something like a queue, right? A queue or some type of buffer that I could send a message to from my client. And then now on the other side, the consumer can start pulling those things in as it needs to on its own pace and whenever it's ready to start processing some of that work. And so one of the good things you get is, you know, once your client, once your producer sends a message over into that queue, you know, you don't have to wait for it. And then two, you kind of have that guarantee that, you know, at least it's going to get picked up and looked at at some point in time. Now on the consumer side, what can happen is that whatever's processing that message can start pulling them off whenever they're ready or whenever it has bandwidth to kind of do that. So, you know, it pulls off one job and it processes it. It pulls off another job and it processes it, right? And it can kind of keep going down the line. But at least then the client isn't waiting on the server and the server isn't waiting on the client. They can kind of operate completely independently, which is great. So now the client doesn't need to even know where the server is and vice versa. Like the client doesn't need to have any special networking rules or any type of security groups or anything like that in relation to where and what the server is doing which is, you know, which is a great thing for kind of segmenting out your networks and being able to have very fine grain control over who's doing what. Now, there might be scenarios where you do want to get a reply back. And what we could do when using message queues is that what well, we could provide within that message that we sent over the wire, like a reply queue. So again, let's say I have an order and I process my order, like I send it into, you know, my, um, you know, whatever service I'm using. Now that service can enqueue my work, it can drop it on this message queue, and then it can also start to add some additional metadata in it. You know, very similar to how we were adding metadata to HTTP to be able to handle those, those retry requests. You know, just in the same way, I can add some metadata, some additional properties to my queuing message so that now after the consumer's finished doing that work, it'll be able to look and say, okay, well, this is where I'm going to put that response. And then, you know, the producer or some other process that's waiting for those responses could keep their eyes out on that reply queue and then be able to pull it out and continue to do whatever other work needs to happen. So, which is a great thing. And now on the, on the other side of the world, if there's errors or if there's any problems that happen, now the consumer can put that inside of a dead letter queue. A dead letter queue is essentially a place that, you know, the messages that we can't work with for one reason or another um, end up going. You know, it might be a case that the message is corrupted or, you know, they can't read the data or it's in some type of invalid format. And now once it gets placed in that other queue, that other queue where all the bad messages go, it has the ability to have another process go ahead and deal with that. You know, and that might be something that kicks off alerts or emails someone or, you know, alerts and guests reaches out to another department for them to come in and, and figure out what's the problem here and maybe even have it requeued back into the regular message queue so you could figure out, you know, well, maybe we just needed to try it again and, you know, and, and keep that going. Now, kind of building up on that last example, another situation you might have is imagine, remember when we had that scenario where we had multiple clients, but there was only so much server that was on the other side to be able to deal with those requests. In your typical request response model, where you had like, again, a, like maybe a few mobile phones or a few, you know, web servers, and then just only so many web servers on the other side, 
it can become very overwhelming if all of these clients are sending messages over and just hammering the resources that are on that server. Like, you know, that server not, might not be able to handle all of those at the same time. And what could also happen now is that, you know, as additional messages keep getting sent to the server, they're just getting queued up. And so now the more clients and the more producers that are there, the longer they're going to have to wait to get their work done. So one way we could solve this is also with using a queue. But now, again, the goal is all of these different messages or all of these different clients are sending messages saying the same queue. And they're not waiting for the response. They're walking away and they're going to go ahead and do something else. The queue right now is acting as a buffer and an intermediary between the producer and the consumer so that now as messages come through, you know, one, the clients or the producers aren't waiting long for their work to get taken care of. But two, the consumer can just pull work out at its own pace, right? So now on the other side, the machine is not getting overwhelmed with the amount of requests that are coming in, which is great. Another thing that we could do to kind of help with that same scenario and kind of add on to what's already happening is that now we can have additional consumers start to look at that exact same queue. You might hear some folks refer to this as the competing consumers scenario. And essentially what's happening here is that instead of just having like one machine or one consumer that's listening to the messages, you can have as many of them as you want, right? Essentially too, what you could do you know, based on the amount of messages that are in the queue, you can even have like some other monitoring system or some alerting system, listen to that queue and dynamically decide, well, how many more of these things do I need to have here, right? So let's say, you know, based on my load, I only have like one or two clients or one or two producers. And then as they're putting messages onto the queue, and you know, as my single consumer is taking messages off the queue, well, maybe that, maybe that ratio is okay. Maybe that ratio is good. But maybe something happens and now there's an increase in load, right? So there's more producers sending messages at a faster rate. Well, on the other side of the, of the consumer or the client, I'm sorry, at the other side with the consumer or the server, it's still going to be able to pull messages out in its own rates. But now the queue is going to continue to get larger and larger and larger and larger. So again, the best way for us to handle that is, well, let's add additional consumers. But now all these consumers are pulling those messages off of that same queue. So now the actual, um, the counts, right, that's stored in that queue will be able to be reduced and, and taken off a lot quickly. And now what we could do is as that load goes down and as we're back into some regular cadence or some regular pace, I don't necessarily need as many consumers as I did before. So I could reduce that count as well. Now, if you're running inside of Azure, we could use things like you know, Azure Monitor and App Insights and those types of things to be able to set up some of this type of infrastructure, to be able to set up some of that monitoring. So they could say, hey, well, whenever I have so many, whenever I pass a certain threshold or whenever I have too many messages in the queue, I want you to send an alert. And now that alert is going to go ahead and kick off some process that could either maybe queue up some additional containers or queue up some additional workers or services to be like, hey, you need to pay attention to this queue here because I really have a lot of load and we need to, to make sure that it's, it's, it's being taken care of in a manageable way. And that's how we could take care of load balancing using a queue. Another popular messaging pattern that you'll see a lot is called publish subscribe. And with the publish subscribe pattern, I can essentially create a topic that I can send messages to and now based on whatever my consumers are interested in or what are they, whatever they want to do, they'll be able to get those messages outside of that topic. One of the ways that this is different from something like a queue is that the consumers can have a subscription, they can subscribe to my topic, and they could supply, they could supply some type of filter. So you can imagine if I was you know, pushing in types of cars or types of colors or whatever the case is, you know, my first consumer might say, hey, well, I'm only interested in these types of cars. And then, you know, consumer two says, I'm only interested in these types of cars, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, I can even have a consumer that says, I'm interested in all cars and I want to be able to look at all those messages and see everything that's coming down because, you know, maybe you need to do auditing or maybe you need to do some type of inspection in terms of what's happening inside of the workflow. But the important part here is that, you know, the consumers here could either receive all the messages or they can receive a subset of the messages or, you know, well, if you didn't want any at all, then I guess you just don't subscribe to it. But 
again, they could be very selective with the information that flows out to them. And this is very different than just using a queue and doing something like competing consumers. With a competing consumers model, what's happening is that every message is going to go to one client. What's different now with doing publish subscribe with topics and filters is that now all our consumers, all our servers can get the messages that they care about, regardless of whether it's been seen by another entity or not. Another common scenario that you'll see a lot with mobile devices and even you know the Internet of Things type applications is a case where the connectivity of the network that you're on is probably very spotty. That's particularly true for cases where that device in question is being moved around a lot. They might move into an area that has you know, no coverage at all and then move into one that has coverage. But because that device is moving around more, because it's transitioning from one physical space to another, it's hard to be able to rely on the stability of that network. But now, what do we do if we want to be able to send messages from these types of devices? Like, How can they communicate with the rest of our application and the rest of our system? And one interesting solution for that problem is to use a smaller localized queue and have that queue forward on your messages to like your main queue or your main broker that you have. So you can imagine a scenario where, again, I have a mobile phone and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing things in my bank account or I'm doing things with an online store or you know, I'm doing some type of work that you know, I'm expecting to have connectivity to do. But now, like, I've just driven through a dead zone and I'm in the backseat. I'm not driving and texting, I promise. Um, but we're in the backseat of the car and we're doing some work. And now I've lost connectivity. Well, does that mean that I need to lose all my work? You know, I don't, in today's standards, I don't think that's a fair, you know, I don't think that's a fair thing for us to expect people to, to people are willing to accept, right? So one thing that we could do is we can store those messages locally. Right? Depending on the device that you're on or the type of you know, platform that you're programming on, you might have some localized queue that you can make use of. You know, and localized might be it's on the device or maybe it's on an internal network and not on the public internet. And so now we could send those messages to that device as like a temporary store. Right? And then whenever connectivity is available again, now those messages can move from that temporary queue and put it into the real one where our consumers are listening to to get that work done. I know there's tons of different options for doing this. Um, I know if you do something like RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ has a shovel plugin, which is really interesting, that you could set up and it will be able to route messages to you know, one or more brokers that are available. Um, I know there's also something called Apache Cupid. Um, they have a project called the Dispatch Router. And essentially, it could you can create these different rules and allow it to funnel messages from one queuing system to another queuing system. But if you remember, we were talking about protocol earlier, right? Being able to leverage open standard protocols is what really makes this possible. You know, if all of our queuing systems are using something different and all of our messaging systems are doing something different, it makes integrating between them very hard. And so scenarios like this would be very expensive and very hard to maintain. But because we're all relying on things like HTTP and AMQP, you know, we're able to create these really interesting types of integrations that allow us to plug in our systems together. All right, so I've been talking a lot. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code and we could see how we can make use of some of this type of infrastructure to create some robust messaging with our asynchronous messaging patterns. And actually, before we dive into Visual Studio Code, what I want to do is head over to the Azure portal. And I want to show you what I have set up already inside of Azure Service Bus inside of the cloud. Now, Azure Service Bus is going to be our queuing system that we're going to use to be sending messages back and forth to. And I went ahead and set up some queues and topics that we're going to use for the demo. Now, let's take a look at this one called Load Queue. Now, as you can see right now, low queue is just one of the default queues that I set up. I haven't created anything special or turned on any special knobs or anything. But what I want to do is show you how I could start sending messages over to this queue and then also processing them using .NET. Okay, and now I'll head back over to Visual Studio Code. And the first thing I want to do is I want to start up my load processor. Now, my load processor was just created using a .NET worker service. Um, and so inside of this worker service, there's really not too much happening here. The main things are happening inside of the execute method and also the process messaging method. So you can see in execute async, I am just doing some logging and then on line 25, 
actually call process messages. And inside of process messages, um, I'm creating an instance of a service bus receiver. I'm also making use of the IASync enumerable support that's inside of C Sharp 8. And since the new service bus client supports it, then you know that's a perfect match. But when I'm getting the messages, nothing really too interesting is happening here. I'm just pulling the messages off of the queue. And if you notice, I'm just, you know, again, printing some lock messages. Messages received, the ID, and then also the body. Now, if you want to know exactly where I created this instance of the Azure Service Bus client, I head over to my program.cs file. And you can see here, what I'm doing is that I'm just injecting a singleton instance of that Service Bus client, and I'm pulling the connection string out of my configuration file. Okay, now what we're going to do is I am going to go ahead and run that. So I'm going to do a .NET run on that client, and I'm going to run the load processor, right? So now I just wanted to sit down and start listening for messages to come off of that queue. Now, as this starts up, it's not going to do anything because, well, as you can imagine, I have nothing that's actually pushing messages into that queue at the moment. So why don't we go ahead and fire up another terminal? And we can also take a look at the load generator. Now the load generator is another project that's in here. It's also implemented as a worker service, as a background worker service. And so as you can see here, very similar to what was happening in the other one, right? I'm gonna to listen to the load queue. I'm going to inject an instance of the Azure Service Bus client. And then I have a method here called generate load. Let me get this thing out of the way really quickly. Right, I have this method here called generate load. There's a little bit more stuff happening here. But essentially, all I'm doing is I am looping through essentially an infinite loop. And every time I go through the loop, I'm adding more and more messages. So the first time I might send five messages. And then the next go, go around, I might send 10 and 20 and 100 and so on and so forth. Right. So essentially, for each client that's generating and pushing messages, the longer it runs, the more load it's going to create. All right. So let's go ahead and run this one as well. So I'll go ahead and execute a, I'll make sure I'll go into the right directory, of course. I'll do a .NET run, and this time, instead of the processor, I'm going to execute the generator, right? So as you can imagine, the generator is gonna go ahead and it's gonna start pushing messages out. You can notice that it says here five messages, and then it's gonna pause for a second. Now it's at 14 messages, it's gonna pause for a second, and then it's gonna go up to now 21 messages. And again, the longer it stays, the longer the message is gonna get processed. Here on the consumer side, inside of my load processor, you can see that I'm starting to process these messages. Now, really quickly back inside of Azure Service Bus, I wanna just refresh this really quickly. You notice it says I have zero active messages. Well, after refresh that, and then you'll notice it'll say, okay, well, now I have 18 messages. And then now 32 messages. Now 39, and then, oh, 55, 60. Wow, okay. So what do you think is actually happening here? Well, what you'll notice is that incrementally, these messages are just gonna keep getting higher and higher and higher. Because even though my processor is running, well, the rate that the client is publishing messages is actually too much. So now my queue is starting to get full. I'm sure if I refresh this again, you'll see, wow, now this is over 100. So what can we do to manage the load of that? Because actually, like, the processor is not under load, but the queue now is has a ton of these messages, and the work is not getting taken care of fast enough. So what I can do, and I'm going to use this split feature here in VS Code, which is really handy. What I'm going to do is just, I'm going to fire up more processors, right? I'm going to fire up more things to be able to handle that load. So I can go ahead, I'll fire up another one here. And, you know, for good measure, I'll just go ahead and fire up a third one, right? But then what you'll notice after a while, you're going to see now that, you know, the message is going to get handled and now my message queue is going to start going down, right? I'm I'm not going to have as many messages sitting inside of the queue as I was before. So hopefully as I head back over here, I should have some much larger number. And then as I continue to refresh, you notice that the number of messages that could keep going down is going to keep going down because again, I have more processors there able to take care of those messages. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop this for now. Now, the next scenario I want to talk to you about really quickly is so what you saw me do here is I actually went ahead and I had to start up instances of these queue workers manually myself. And, you know, I'm just running here on my laptop, so that's fine. But what happens if we're in production, right? Like you can't really expect someone to be sitting down and 
looking at the cues all the time and waiting for them to like spike up or spike down and manually adjust that loader. Well, we can actually make use of some of the metric features that are inside of Azure to be able to do that. So here, if I come back inside of my service bus instance, I can head over to metrics and alerts. And what you'll see here is that I actually went ahead and set up an alert. And so if I come in here, I can click on, for instance, manage alerts or manage alert rules. And then it could show me some of these different alerts that I already have set up. So notice I have this one here that says Q, load queue alert. And if I click on that, you can notice that this one is particularly scoped to my service bus namespace. That's messaging patterns that I created for this demo. I also can specify a condition. So if I click on this, it'll open this blade on the right side and notice it will let me know, hey, for this entity named load queue, actually, if I scroll back up here, it's looking at the count of the messages within this particular queue that's inside of my namespace. So for this entity named load queue, whenever that count is greater than 10, that's the threshold that I set, I want you to fire off alert, right? And then I want you to check for this every five minutes, right? So you notice we have an interval there that's set up for whenever this checks. So no, that's the condition of the alert. Now what actually happens with the alert is gonna be specified here inside of the action group. So again, I have an action group I created before. And what I did was, you know, I gave it a name, but I also said that for the action type, I actually specified an Azure function. And so now whenever my threshold is hit and that alert fires, it's gonna trigger all the actions I have here. And in this case, it's just an Azure function. And if I edit this, what you'll see is that inside of my Azure function, I have a method that is gonna call to be like, okay, well now we get in, you know, now I'm gonna start doing some work, right? And this is the name of my actual function here, right? It's called QMetrics Alert. And so now all I have to do is deploy this into the cloud. And within my function, I can define something like, you know, some alerts that could either go ahead and email an additional person or an additional group of folks, or I could trigger off my automation. I can have it go ahead and use the service bus client or the ACI client or something else to spin up additional workers, wherever they happen to be, to go ahead and process that work. And, you know, I actually have a function here that I set up, you know, the code for that same function that you saw. And again, it's not a lot of code. Well, it's not a lot of code because I'm not actually processing the message in here. But essentially, like, this is all I have to do to set up an Azure function. But, you know, one of the options we have is to use, again, like something like app service or, or spin up some container process. And we could do that via code or, you know, via some other type of automation to go ahead and create that stuff for us. So, so that's a great example of how we could monitor the messages that are going inside of our queue and then have them handled, you know, have that alert handled by some function to go ahead and, you know, take the necessary steps that come after that. Okay. Now, let's head back over to the Azure portal. And for this last piece, I do want to show you how I set up um, the topics. Went out too far? All right, so back into the messaging patterns namespace. So I show you the queues that I have, but I also have these topics that are here. And this topic I have here is called shows. Now, what I'm planning to do is, well, you know, since we've all been home and we're all watching a lot of you know, streaming shows, at least me and my family have. So I want to get alerts. I want to get notifications every time specific shows are created or sent to the different streaming platforms that we use. So you can see here at the bottom, I have one for Disney Plus, I have one for Hulu, and I also have one for Netflix. So inside of this topic, these are different subscriptions, right? So these are subscriptions to the topic shows. And if I click into one of these subscriptions, you see my subscription has a filter, right? And so the purpose of the filter is to say, hey, anything that's listening to this topic subscription, you know, you're going to get the messages that are satisfied by this filter, okay? So what is in this filter? And as you can imagine, it's going to look for a key inside of the AMQP message that's going to come in through Azure Service Bus because, again, Azure Service Bus supports AMQP 1.0. It's going to look inside of those custom properties and say, hey, do you have something called platform inside of your properties with a value of Disney? And if you do, well, you know, those are the messages for me. Those are messages I care about and I want to see. And in these other two very similar, 
you know, setups are happening, right? Like, so I have a filter for Hulu shows and a filter for Netflix shows in those respective, um, in those respective subscriptions that are there. Okay. Now, let's see how we handle this inside of code. Now, as you can imagine, I have two other projects that are here. Now, I have one here um, called Show Topic Subscriber. And again, this is a worker service, just like before. And the difference, what you'll notice here is that for this receiver, I'm not only receiving just the name of the topic, but I'm also taking in um, the platform. And the platform essentially is just, you know, what's that, you know, what's the name of that um, subscription that I want to listen to, right? So again, the name of my topic is shows. And then, you know, the platform could be something like Hulu, Netflix, or Disney Plus. Right? And again, let's take a look at the publisher really quickly. Um, again, also very similar situation. Um, I think it's a good thing that a lot of this code looks the same because you can see how easy it is to use a service bus client. But anyway, I have this loop that's going around and actually at the top, I have an enum. I'll show you what the enum looks like. Very straightforward enum. And I'm going to pick a random show or a random platform from that enum. And then I'm going to go ahead all the way down here into generate show topic messages. And I'm just going to generate some random shows, right? But the important part to see here is that when I'm creating that message, I'm specifying a platform, right? And that platform being, again, Hulu, Disney Plus, or, or Netflix, right? And so now that's going to be the property that, you know, Service Bus is going to look at, that your, you know, our broker is going to look at to be able to filter those messages as they go through those different topics. All right. Now, I can go ahead and just kind of spin these up, but I think instead what I'll do is, you know, I'll use this Docker Compose file that I created to run these things. And if you're unfamiliar with Docker Compose, it's essentially just a way that allowed me to run some containers and I'll just specify, well, where they are and what I want them to do. So this one here is just the topic generator. Again, we spoke about that just now. But then now I have three different subscribers here. And the difference is that for each of them, I'm passing in a different environment variable. So one for the, you know, each of them has a very different um, topic based on the platform that it's coming from. And that's going to be the platform they're going to listen for. Now, because I'm in VS Code, I could, you know, I can make use of that Docker um, extension that we have. I can right click on my Docker file and I can do compose up. And, you know, hopefully I don't have any other containers running. Um, I should have checked before I did this. But what I'm expecting to happen is now it's going to build my project. It's going to spin up all my different containers. And now I'm going to have three different versions of the same publisher code running, um, each of them listening to a different show platform. And then I'm also going to have the processor running and it's going to be able to like continuously send messages over to that queue. I'm sorry, messages over to that topic. All right. So let's take a look at the topic. Um, I'm just going to hit this refresh button. Right. And notice as we hit this refresh button on the bottom of the screen, you can notice that the numbers are changing to so notice how, you know, the message count is different every time I keep refreshing them. And that's because, as you can expect in the background, you know, our topics and our our subscriptions are working in the background to be able to move uh, messages back and forth between some of those. Now, for some reason, it doesn't look like Disney's getting as many messages as some of the other ones, but that's fine. I mean, that's how the, the way the world works sometimes. Now, the last demo I want to show you, at least with regards to, um, to sending asynchronous messages, is I actually want to show you how we could take care of that sparse connectivity scenario using a combination of RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus. Now, I have RabbitMQ running here locally in my machine. And what I've done in my particular instance is I've enabled something called the Shovel plugin. And it's something that you can enable via the configuration. Um, and then you'll see it here inside of the admin section. But I've enabled the Shovel plugin, and I've also enabled the AMQP 1.0 plugin. And now what I'm going to try to do is I want to set this up so it could send messages that come into RabbitMQ and then follow them over into, um, into Azure Service Bus. So what you see here, I can add something called a new shovel. And so with the new shovel, I could give it a name. And here I can specify the source queue. So the source queue could be, well, where exactly am I pulling this from? And so since I want to pull this from this instance of RabbitMQ, you know, I'll give it the name of a queue that I created here. And then obviously I'll add, you know, if I wanted Azure Service Bus, I have to change this to AMQP 1.0. 
um, you know, specify what that connection string information is and so on and so forth. And then I can go ahead and add the shovel. Now I went ahead and created one cause I didn't want you to see me messing around and, you know, playing around with that. But you know, I already have one here that's set up and it's going to listen to a queue that's here on RabbitMQ called Azure Service Bus. And it's going to take those messages and it's going to forward them up into the cloud. Now, let's see what that queue looks like before we send the messages, and then we'll come back and take a look after I send those messages over. So I just have this one here called queues. It's this one here called rabbit ingest. And you know, this one has 32 messages because you know I was sending messages in here before. But now this is going to be the destination. So remember this count, right? We're going to expect this count to go up after I start sending messages in. Now back into the rabbit management uh, UI. Right, I'm going to click on this Azure Service Bus queue. And at the bottom, what I like about this RabbitMQ management UI is I could go ahead and send test messages. So, you know, let's go ahead and send, you know, test one, publish, message sent, test two, test three, you know, so on and so forth. I think you I think you all kind of get the point. Right. But now what I'm hoping to see is you notice it says here ready zero, you know, on act zero, total zero. But notice our little graph went up. So that means that the messages did arrive in this queue, but they're no longer there. So I'm hoping if we come back to our Azure service bus, notice I had 32 messages. If I refresh this, now I have 35 messages, right? But how did that happen, right? Like I decided that, well, hey, I was gonna make use of my local queue, you know, my local broker, which just happened to be RabbitMQ running on my local machine. And, you know, whenever it decided it was connected and it was ready to funnel messages over, now I had the ability to send messages from where I am here to the cloud. And, you know, whatever clients and whatever consumers are connected to the cloud could go ahead and start processing that. And I think that enables some really interesting scenarios in terms of like integration between different systems, but also, you know, dealing with that sparse connectivity scenario where, you know, I might not have access to the outward I might not have access to the outside world all of the time. Maybe I only have access some of the time, but I always have access inside of my network internally. So now I have the ability to publish messages in there and have them set up to the cloud. Okay. All right. Now let's head back to our slides. Now we're going to do a really quick recap of everything that we covered today. So we started off talking about synchronous patterns that we could use. So, you know, with synchronous patterns, we have things like, gRPC, we have things like HTTP that we could use. And in that type of situation, you know, clients are able to send messages and now they're going to expect responses back really quickly. And they're going to have to wait for whenever those responses come back from the server or the receiver, whatever it is that's going to process those messages. But with that, we're going to have some expectations such as, you know, whenever errors happen, whenever, you know, things don't work out the same way, we get immediate feedback from that type of mechanism. And now the client is going to be in charge of reacting to those changes right then and there. Then we also spoke about asynchronous communication patterns. And this usually involves some type of intermediary. So a service bus queue or RabbitMQ or some type of broker in the middle that's going to be able to handle those uh, messages as they come in. But what's great about this type of scenario is that the sender and the receiver are completely decoupled. So that means that the sender doesn't know where the receiver is and the receiver doesn't know where the sender is. And all they need to know about is, you know, they have a core central place where they're going to both be looking at for messages. So this allows them to kind of exist in different places and in different security boundaries, which gives us a different level of flexibility. Now, that's about it for the talk. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you appreciated it. Um, I really enjoyed preparing this talk and, and giving it to you today. Um, if you want to learn more, if you want to get some resources about you know, messaging and, you know, different .NET packages that you could use and also take a look at the samples. I encourage you to head over to this link at www.drlist.com slash distributed messaging patterns. But other than that, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Cecil Phillip, and I really enjoyed speaking to you all today. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to me on social media if you have any questions. But other than that, please enjoy the rest of .NET 2020.